Good evening and welcome to Live at Grange. Live at Grange is our panel discussion coming to you every evening as part of the Chagusk Virtual Beef Week supported by FBD Trust. Each day we are focusing on a different topic and today our focus is suckler systems. So join me and our panel of experts in the studio for Live at Grange. Good evening and welcome to Live at Grange. Live at Grange is coming to you as part of the Chagusk Virtual Beef Week, sponsored by FBD Trust. Each day as part of the Chagusk Virtual Beef Week, we are covering a different topic. And today our focus is suckling systems. We've had wonderful engagement throughout the day on social media and on our earlier broadcast, Beef Talk at midday. This evening, we're staying on that theme of suckling systems. However, we now move to a live and interactive broadcast. It's live coming from the studio here at Grange, and it's interactive, so we encourage you to participate by text on 51444 for viewers in the Republic of Ireland, or on Twitter using the hashtag Virtual Beef Week. This evening, our two focus topics are breeding efficiency and herd health, two critical areas of performance for suckling systems. I'm joined in the studio by our panel of experts, Professor David Kenny from Chagas Grange, Frank O'Sullivan, veterinary practitioner and who provides services to the research centre here at Grange, and Dr Orla Keane, research scientist with Chagas Grange. We're going to start with breeding efficiency. Before I move to David Kenny to discuss all aspects of breeding efficiency, we're first going to play you some footage we recorded last week. We met with Arlie Bert, who is a prize-winning suckler farmer in County Down. Artie participated in a research trial led by David Kenny a number of years ago. And we'll hear how Artie got on in the trial and his farm systems. So we'll see Artie now. My name's Artie Burt. I uh, run a suckler to beef farm here in County Down just at the tip of the Ards Peninsula. We, cows are predominantly Sim Limbs and Charlie Terminal Sire. We take everything through the beef and bucket rear a few calves as well. We're up on cow numbers. We had a very tight calving spring herd of 180-ish and 190 cows and we had seven stock bulls. We found that the stock bulls finished up lying about all year. They were only needed a few weeks. We finished up then, you had, although you maybe only needed four or five bulls, you always had young bulls that needed small groups. You always needed a spare bull because at some stage during the year something got hurt. We found then they were lying about. You had seven bulls in the house. It was costing too much to keep them. We started looking at another option. Yeah, we were involved with the joint Hillsborough and Chuggis research trial back in 2014. Um, we found we got conception results of between 60 and 72 ish percent to first service. We have been using uh, synchronization since probably back as far as 2012. Um, we have found as a, it is a good tool to keep the calving interval tight. Um, we were we would have used it on the late calvers to pull them forward, the stragglers. You can go in from 30 days and you can tighten them up. But we also found that you, had, you were more focused on a breeding season. You had a start date and a finish date and you didn't have a rogue bull floating about that you needed a home for and you were inclined to let calvin linger on. Uh, typically we would have done a fixed time AI, would have got everything served once. We would then have possibly either done repeat AI, depending on the availability of, of sweeper bulls, or sweeper bull, the sweeper bull could have alternated between two batches of cows, and would have probably done that twice. And we were only focused on repeat AI with a batch of cows. Uh, you would only have been focused for two five-day windows whenever they were due to repeat and repeat again. You weren't 
all the time, continuously watching watching cows. Uh, the most number of cows we ever synchronised on one particular day was 81. And there's a natural spread anyway in cows, um, from the cow that calves 10 days early to the one that will run over 14 days or so late. We would have 12 calving pens to 180 cows. It wasn't a huge issue calving that many cows. Uh, would use to our advantage, would use typically, use the gestation length of the bull to your advantage. You could use a shorter gestation limousine, hope to get them calved before the longer gestation Charlies maybe come in. One, another advantage that I see in doing this, you're able to negotiate prices because you're doing so many. You can you can say you can phone the vet and you can ask them their price and you can negotiate it, or you can negotiate your AI technician what he's going to cost. You bulk buy your semen, you can get the semen of genetically better bulls. You can use the figures as a figures will have accuracy as opposed to the the stock bull. No matter how good your stock bull is, your figures will not be as nearly as accurate or the, the as what you'll get out of the an AI catalogue. Some really interesting points there by Artie. I'll now turn to Professor David Kenny of Chagas Grange, who led the project that Artie referred to. David, you led this project on synchronisation and the use of AI in the suckler herd. Can you tell us and tell the farmers watching here this evening, what were the main findings from that research project? Yes, Paul. Uh, Artie uh, was one of 80 farmers that participated in the Department of Agriculture, uh, Food and the Marine sponsored uh, two-year project for us. Um, and essentially we were comparing three different synchronization timed AI programs on farm. Um, cows were subjected at about 35 days after calving um, to the program um, and they received one timed insemination. Follow-up breedings then were either natural service sires that the, the farmers may have on their, or the farms or they, some farmers elected to, to breed the repeat cows by AI. And I suppose overall we, f we found you know, very acceptable um, conception rates of somewhere between 50 and uh, 70 percent, averaging at about 55 percent, which is you know, quite significant when you consider that half of those cows at the start of the breeding season hadn't resumed normal cyclicity. So essentially we're inducing heat, we'll say, in, in, in a large number proportion of those cows. Overall, when we combined, I suppose, the timed AI with the subsequent breeding of those cows three, week la three weeks later, we found that 80 percent of those cows were pregnant in the first three weeks of the breeding season. So obviously that has you know, significant, I suppose, positive ramifications for not alone the duration of the breeding season, but also in terms of shortening, we'll say, or condensing the, the following calving season. And as a consequence, then again, there will be knock-on effects for the following year, mm -hmm. in that the cows, that ov overall herd, will be tightened up in terms of uh, uh, breeding and uh, calving. Okay, and, and Artie mentioned that, you know, he's, he's, he used to have a number of stock bulls on the farm. That was his traditional breeding system. He's now moved to a greater use of AI. Apart from the, the I suppose, the labour performance that he found with using more AI, what other benefits would you see through the farmers and in general from the use of AI in the suckler herd? Well, obviously, as, as Artie alluded to there, you know, there's significant advantages in terms of, I suppose, just the, the information that you have on those bulls that you're using. You know, you can choose bulls with a much greater degree of certainty for the traits that you're interested in, whether that be in terms of breeding high value maternal uh, replacements or indeed uh, bulls to produce terminal progeny. Equally, when it comes to calving, you know, difficulty or calving ease, you know, you, know, you, can, you can select bulls for either your heifers or for maybe your second calvers with, you know, a fairly, I suppose, uh, strong uh, confidence that those bulls would say have a propensity to produce smaller calves at birth. Mm -hmm. So obviously that, and you know, most farmers would acknowledge that on average would say calves from you know, AI sires are better quality and produce better quality calves, we'll say, than your know, run-of-the-mill average uh, stock bull. So substantial benefits from the use of AI. Uh, I suppose in terms of the trail and in general, uh, were the pre predominantly mature cows or were there heifers involved? And would you have a different protocol for heifers when compared to mature cows? Yes, in that, by the design of that um, study, Paul, they were all at least first calvers. We had no, we had no heifer. Okay. You know, um, 
Absolutely, you can use timed AI protocols for heifers, but you know, I suppose our advice would be to try to grow heifers you know, in a way that they're a high proportion of them are cycling or you know, have um, gone through puberty at the start of the breeding season. And then if that's the case, a much cheaper, we'll say, and straightforward, maybe prostaglandin-based protocol would suffice. You know, and you know, for viewers and for farmers that are interested in, we, we have a lot of information and a lot of detail on, Chagask, uh, on the Chagas website in terms of the different options that are available both for heifers and for cows. Absolutely, and we'd recommend our viewers to, to view the Chagas website for more information in relation to all of these protocols. Absolutely. Um, I suppose, you know, one of the questions that, that often arises is, you know, are we uh, inadvertently, if you like, breeding for, for poor fertility by using these, you know, uh, interventions, uh, synchronization protocols? So, you know, the cows would obviously more than likely have been culled at the end of the breeding season. So are we inadvertently breeding for poor fertility? I don't think so, Paul. And again, this is something, you know, anecdotally that might be mentioned from time to time. But I think I would argue that it's the opposite. You know, essentially, you cannot make an infertile cow fertile by using these uh, type of interventions. It's, uh, you know, it's really just a tool to, I suppose, synchronize breeding. You know, uh, whether it be that you want to optimize, we'll say, the use of um, AI for maternal replacements, or indeed maybe just shorten up or tighten up, we'll say, your calving interval. I would argue that it's the exact opposite in that this allows us, uh, us to increase the amount of use and usage of AI to breed better and more fertile females. Like if we, you know, uh, if we look at ICBF-based uh, statistics, only about one in six of every calves born to beef cows in Ireland are bred through AI, you know, with over 85% bred through natural ser service. And that doesn't bode well, maybe, mm. for the use of the superior genetics that we pride ourselves in Ireland, we'll say, in terms of producing. Yeah, very, I suppose, disappointing figures, one yeah. in six being, being, being bred by AI. I suppose if, if, if I could turn to you, Frank O'Sullivan, as, as a vet in practice, have you seen an increase in the use of synchronization regimes and protocols and, and in general the use of AI? And where have you seen from a farmer's perspective and the farmers you're working with, where have you seen the main benefits of, of, of adopting these type of protocols? Yeah, well, in addition to the points that David made, um, many of the circular farmers that we deal with are part time. Uh, and they actually like the fixed time and synchronization protocols because it allows them to manage their time better. Uh, it takes away the multiple maybe time slots spent with heat detection. And not only does it allow the, the synchronization and AI to be fixed, but also down the road, it allows the groups of calves to be managed together, maybe the calving time to be focused on. So if you like, suitable use of resources at, the, at those times. So in addition, the suckler cow is different to the dairy cow. She, she doesn't express heat well when she's suckling. And fixed time AI in particular takes that out of the equation, if you like. Now, many of our farmers, like David said, also like the concept they can choose the, the bull with AI to match that cow. Mm. Uh, plus, there's a higher reliability. They're more, if you like, using AI, they're, they're more confident of the end product in terms of what calf is coming out. Mm -hmm. I suppose if I, if I turn back to you, David, uh, we mentioned that you know one in six approximately using AI, so the vast, vast majority of breeding being done with natural service, with stock bulls still. Um, I suppose you know, in the longer and in, indeed in the medium term, we want to see more use of AI, but for the, for the here and now, uh, we have a lot of stock bull usage and we're coming near the end of the breeding season. So what should farmers be watching for, I suppose, as we approach the end of the breeding season for spring calving herds? And indeed, you know, at the end of that season, how should they manage those stock bulls uh, at the end of the season and in preparation, I suppose, for, uh, for later in the year? Well, absolutely, Paul. I think that, you know, unusually high repeats. You know, obviously, we'll say vigilance is absolutely key when it comes to, not alone, you know, heat detection for AI, but absolutely when it comes to natural service. You know, that we can never presume that a bull is fertile or indeed, we'll say, mating cows properly. And that, you know, particularly uh, is of relevance to young bulls. Mm. So, you know, I, I suppose our advice would always be, you know, whether it be, you know, a, an older bull that has been used, we'll say, before, or indeed, we'll say, a young bull, never assume that they're fertile, mm. you know. And we know that for, while absolute infertility might be quite rare, you know, subfertility can have a prevalence of, you know, you know about 20 to 25%. And that can actually cause a lot more damage in terms of, we'll say, her pregnancy rates than infertility on its own. So essentially, you know, we would always advise, we'll say, that 
the farmers should follow up with say, the, particularly the first uh, cohort of cows that have been mated, make sure particularly a young bull is, able, is, is, is physically able to mate the cows and you know, get their vet to scan cows in earlier 30 days approximately after uh, mating to ensure that, you know, that normal pregnancy rates have been achieved. When it comes to, I suppose, the end of the season, obviously the bull you know, needs to be, to be uh, maintained you know, in good condition and it has to receive the same you know, veterinary and health inputs as the cow herd. You know, and obviously accommodation needs to be suitable as well because we know from statistics from the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation that actually up to almost 50% of bulls are culled, not for infertility or not even for poor calf uh, progeny, but in terms of actually locomotive and hurt and, and uh, injuries that they might receive. Mm. So, the, you know, I suppose, again, vigilance with the care of the animals is, is crucial. Thank you very much, David. So we've seen there, in terms of breeding efficiency, the importance of herd health, and clearly it underpins an efficient breeding system. We're going to focus in a lot more detail now on herd health, and I'm going to turn to Frank O'Sullivan for a discussion around the aspects of herd health planning. Before I do, I, I caught up with Frank last week during one of his visits to Grange, and Frank outlined to us you know, what are the principles underpinning good herd health planning as part of the Grange system? So my name is Frank O'Sullivan. I'm a veterinary practitioner providing veterinary services to Chagas Grange. Our role here, be it with the Derry Patrick Suckler herd or indeed with the rearing Frisian calves for beef is really to avoid disease. Now that disease of course could be clinical or subclinical and prevention is the key. Herd health planning is an ongoing process that helps us capture at key times of the year what the key diseases are and put in place the steps to prevent that. But that could involve looking at things like ventilation, maybe having the nutrition uh, at an optimal level and then we can use vaccinations as a support to boost the immunity. We're very aware of the biosecurity aspect in terms of bringing in animals from outside can disturb that biosecurity and really this, what this means is that at different times of the year we would say in the spring have a meeting prior to calving so we can say well how can we prevent calf scours from happening this year or how do we reduce the incidence of pneumonia in, in our calves? By taking this preventative approach and with herd health planning involving all the team, the advisors, the operatives on the ground, we really have found over the last few years that antibiotic usage has gone way, way down. And of course the consumer and the public really like this approach. So a really interesting introduction to herd health planning there by Frank O'Sullivan. Frank, as I said, is the veterinary practitioner who provides services to us here at Chagas Grange. He is also on a number of committees with Animal Health Ireland. And I'll turn to Frank now to discuss in a little bit more detail the practical aspects of herd health planning. So Frank, I suppose herd health planning, what exactly does that mean in practice when you're on, on, on farms? Well, herd health planning, the main outcome of it is to save the farmer money and make more profit for the farm. So typically what's involved is that the farmer, the vet and the Chagas advisor would come together at key times of the year and plan for the season ahead. So to give it an example perhaps to, to, to make the point, I recall one 40 cow suckler farmer who through the years had terrible problems with calf diarrhea, triple spilling in fact, and in the last couple of seasons, we, we, we uh, came together in January. Uh, we looked at his dry cows and said, look, what can we do to prevent this disease happening uh, through the coming season? So the farmer had came up with many of the solutions himself and he got the body condition score correct. That was a key point. He had the mineral inputs into the, into the cows correctly. And then he, he elected to use a calf scour vaccine to help with the transfer of immunity to the, to the young calf when he was born. 
So in that process then, everybody would contribute. So it's not a top-down approach, if you like. Mm. It's a collaborative or a joint effort to come up with these key solutions. Through the season, we went then and said, look, how can we improve the hygiene in the calving areas? Where can we allow, if you like, the ventilation improve and better aeration of the shed? So all these points then, with this collaborative approach, help you come up with a plan. And you, we map that out, write it down, and uh, share it with the farmer so that he then has a clear plan, if you like, how he's going to manage the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, so in essence, that means that he has more time in prevention of disease and less time spent treating disease. Um, lastly, I'll say that apart from the economic benefit, uh, there's a tremendous saving in preventing subclinical disease, that is disease that maybe is not overtly there but uh, certainly can cause problems with production. But thinking about that farmer and farmers in general, they really don't like dealing with disease or sick animals. Yeah. So there's a tremendous stress involved in that and they would really, particular part-time farmers, they love that concept of how can I plan this out so I can go to work in comfort perhaps and come home to enjoy a healthy herd rather than coming home to, to, to sick animals. Okay, so we, you've seen a significant reduction, let's say, in clinical call-outs, if you want to call it that, uh, where herd health planning has become part of the management process on the farm. Yes, that, that is certainly the case. Um, and not only that, the clinical call-outs, you probably end up using quite a bit of uh, antibiotics and mm. uh, so on to, to very sick animals. And the treatment outcomes can often be poor. Mm -hmm. So if you like, the time is much better spent focusing back upstream and preventing these. Yeah. So if you like, herd health planning, planning is a key word here now, mm. because planning shows that there's a dynamic going on. It's not just a plan sitting on the wall for the year. It's, it's, there, there's a dynamic going through it as well. And, you know, part of that, too, is you might have to put in certain monitors to mm. see how is it going. So Orla will mention parasites and we'll see how the faecal sampling is a monitor to tell mm. you how you're managing things. Mm -hmm. um, for that calf, the farmer with the calf diarrhea, we, we used and do in Derry Patrick herd as well. We took uh, blood samples from the calves less than a week and looked at their transfer of colostrum. We were able to look at their Ig levels and say, yes, they've got enough colostrum. We're doing a good job there. Mm -hmm. So planning, if you like, it, it helps to reinforce to the farmer that you can, you're doing a good job here. Mm -hmm. And it's no harm when, when that news is shared. It's almost a, a celebration in that way. So, but the, the monitor, monitors are key and farmers are very good at, if you like, uh, looking at their animals and uh, then they become deft at, at uh, assessing their wellness, if you like, as mm. well. And, and has that changed the relationship between the farmer and the veterinary practitioner? So we've moved from, if you like, a reactive approach where health incidences occur on the farm to a much more proactive approach, it would seem. Yes, I, I, would, I would agree with that point. So that our role has changed to one where we share information and um, you know, the, so the farmer is a co-developer, a co-author, uh, if you like, of the herd health plan. Mm. And that means that you know, if you design something, you're going to take ownership of it. If someone shoves a plan at you or forces it at you, you're less likely to take it up. Mm. There's another bit to this now. The farmer knows his animals. He knows his farm. He knows what works. He knows what he can manage to do and what not. So we would try and work with, within those constraints, if you like. And if a farmer has certain helps at, help at weekends or certain facilities, we work within that. And that means that the plan is bespoke to him. It's individual to, mm. to them. And they can, they can adopt those principles you know, and, and look forward to doing that. So we find, you know, for me, it has revolutionized how I work, mm. uh, communicating very openly with farmers, uh, and if you like, often working more as, as a facilitator mm. than uh, top down telling you these are the four things you must do. That doesn't work. We know that. Yeah. 
And, and when we view, I suppose, the policy measures and proposals that are coming through, particularly with respect to antimicrobial usage, presumably hair tail planning now would become a much greater part of that relationship between practitioners uh, and farmers. Yes, I mean, and we, we even see this in the Derry Patrick herd, where we would have these regular meetings, maybe one in the springtime in January with, with Michael McManus earlier today and all the, the researchers. Maybe again, pre-housing is another key time for, for, for a herd health meeting. What we found is that, yes, the use of vaccine, vaccines has increased. Uh, and similarly, there's been a significant reduction in the antibiotics we use on the farms where the herd health planning is in place. Mm. So really the, the consumer just loves that. Mm. And it's going to be more and more important, as I would suggest, as time goes on. You've also men mentioned, as part of the footage, the importance of biosecurity. Do you want to maybe just uh, develop that a little bit? How important and, and where do you see that coming as, as part of a herd health plan? Well, um, indeed, David mentioned you know, the use of the bulls and, and whatnot. They can be, even for a closed circular herd that's buying in uh, a bull, that can often be the animal that breaches the biosecurity boundary, if you like. Look, in, 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 I think it's a fair statement to say for practices across the country, herds that are closed and have a secure biosecure uh, boundaries and don't buy in animals uh, routinely, they have much less trouble with disease and probably better performance. Yeah than herds who are very open and buying in a lot of the time. So uh, biosecurity is, is such an important concept. Um, I recall my father used to delight in coming home from Kilkenny Mart. He'd, he'd have different animals home every weekend and you know he'd upset the whole herd uh, uh, for the weeks after. Mm. So really the concept of biosecurity goes alongside maybe a vaccination policy. Mm. Now biosecurity isn't just the fact of buying in animals. So being biosecure also means you have to think about the people and the fomites. So you know maybe we shouldn't be sh uh, sharing uh, trailers, yeah. maybe yeah. we shouldn't be sharing uh, handling facilities and I know as a vet and AI technicians are the same that we're very conscious to disinfect in and out mm. as we go to farms. Yeah. Um, mm. Animal Health Ireland are very strong in this too. Yeah. And we see the benefits of the BVD scheme and the lack of introduction of PIs from one farm to another. So yeah, yeah biosecurity is a big part of it. Yeah. You, you mentioned the importance of covering the whole area of parasite burden and parasitic infection. Uh, and I might turn to Dr. Orla Keane now just in relation to that. Uh, and I suppose it's an area where, where you've devoted a lot of your time and a lot of your research, Orla. And just in terms of the Derry Patrick herd, do you want to maybe relate a little bit of you know, the, the, the parasite control plan that's, that's in place there on the Derry Patrick herd? Yeah, so I suppose in, in, on the Derry Patrick herd here in Grange, the two major parasites, and particularly at this time of year that, they're, that we're concerned about, are lungworm and, the gut, and gut worms. Now, the way the weather went this year, we had a very dry spring. So when you get prolonged periods of dry weather like that, the worm burden tends to stay low. So the larval stage of these parasites, they migrate, they move in water. So when you get a dry period, they can't migrate out of the dung or up the grass to be eaten. So the worm burden mm. tends to stay low. Then after you get some rain, you'll probably see the, the larval burden will go up about two weeks afterwards. You won't see it in the, in the fecal samples that Frank mentioned earlier till probably at least three, four weeks later. So what we found this year in the Derry Patrick was that in terms of the, the, the gut worm count, that has been low and that has stayed low so far. And that's probably because, you know, in suckler beef systems, it's really only when you get close to weaning and their grass intake um, increases substantially mm. that gut worms tend to be a problem. Lungworm can be a lot more unpredi unpredictable. And, um, you know, ab about three weeks ago now, we did go in and treat for lungworm based on clinical signs. Okay. And I, I suppose, uh, back to, to you, Frank, just in terms of the overall hair tail planning process, um, we've seen some wonderful figures from, from, from Bernadette early this morning, uh, and in particular from Michael McManus in terms of the performance of the Derry Patrick Herd with 100% AI, calving in a 10-week breeding season, uh, really fabulous performance, underpinned by a strong focus on herd health planning. One of the figures, though, that Bernie did produce that maybe surprised me a little bit uh, was that as part of a research uh, uh, programme that, that she carried out recently, 
60% of antibiotic usage occurred in the first month of life. So this would seem to be a, a critical period where a lot of intervention occurs, a lot of antibiotic usage occurs. Um, as part of a herd health planning process, where would you see as the key factors to maybe minimise that, that period and minimise the amount of antibiotic usage during that period? Yeah, so if you get things right in the first month or two months of life, the health of the animal and the production really flows very well. Uh, so we'd see two major challenges. One would be enteric disease in the newborn calf. I've mentioned that earlier. So uh, part of our work there is to look at the particular herd, look what issues they have, know what's happening on the ground, be it cryptosporidia, rotavirus, E. coli, and put prevention strategies for that. Now, probably more subtle but very, very significant then is the respiratory disease. And that can often be insidious in, in onset. It can be subtle enough in calves. So we look very strongly at, the, at the, the bedding, the cleanliness, the ventilation is key. And then in, in the dairy patrick herd and in many other herds, we use vaccination programs, both intranasal and injection to prevent or help support the immunity against key uh, diseases such as RSV, PI3, uh, Pasteurella, uh, and even IVR later mm -hmm. on. So, you know, we're aware of these bugs are around, but, you know, I, I, I recall the UCD herd health team advising us on one occasion, they came to visit Grain saying, uh, will, will you stop hunting bugs and try and just get, you know, we know the these viruses are circulating there, just let the environment, the immunity, the, the if you like, the nutrition, supported by vaccination, mm -hmm. not relying solely on vaccination. Mm -hmm. uh, let them work together and then you will see how, you know, you, you have much le less disease footprint in, in the herd. Thank you. So a multifaceted approach. Yeah. So thank you, Frank. Um, we've seen the importance of herd health planning. And we've touched a little bit on parasitic infection and the importance of control around parasitic infection. We're going to deal with that in a little bit more detail with Dr. Orla Keane from Chagas Grange. But before I turn to Orla, I caught up with Orla in her lab last week to discuss some of the programme around parasite control strategies uh, on suckler farms. So I'm Orla Keane and I'm a researcher in Chagas Grange. Irish cattle production aims to maximise the contribution of grazed grass to lifetime feed intake of the animal. But of course one of the consequences of grazing is exposure to gastrointestinal uh, parasites or gut worms. So there are a number of different gut worm species that can infect cattle but they all have a similar life cycle. So adult female worms in the gut, they, they lay eggs and those eggs pass out with the dung onto the grass. The eggs hatch into larvae and the larvae then move out of the dung onto the grass where they are eaten by grazing animals. The larvae then go to their site of infection in the gut where they mature into adults that lay eggs, thus completing the life cycle. So when calves are born, they're fully susceptible to gut worms. However, suckler calves, because grazed grass uh, isn't the major contributor to their diet early in their life, generally gut worms are not a big problem in suckler calves in the early and mid season. And it's usually closer to weaning when they have a much greater grass intake uh, that gut worms can become a problem. So in most years, suckler calves only require minimal treatment. Yearlings, if, if they don't fully develop immunity in their first year, yearlings may require treatment for gut worms. Now there are a number of different products available uh, to treat gut worms, but they all belong to one of three classes. So these are the benzamidazoles, or the white doses, levamazole, or the yellow doses, and the macrocyclic lactone, or the clear doses. So it's important to note that once resistance develops to one product in a class, then all of the products in the same class are generally affected. And this is because all of the products in the same class have a similar mode of action. So if you have resistance to uh, one white drench, you generally have resistance to all of the white drenches. So we know now that resistance has arisen on a number of cattle farms in Ireland and that this is an issue that farmers need to 
uh, will need to deal with in the future. It's important that we reduce our reliance on antlementics and one of the ways that we can do this is to reduce the exposure of naive animals to uh, worms. So there are a few different ways of doing this. One way is to creep graze calves ahead of the cows. Um, as the cows come along behind them, they will clean up the pasture after them. If you have cattle and sheep, then mixed grazing of cattle and sheep can also reduce exposure. And this is because the worms that infect cattle are not the same species that infect sheep and vice versa. So one of the risks for the development of antlementic resistance is underdosing. So it's really important that when treating an animal with an antlementic that they're given the correct amount of product. So in order to do this, it's best, if possible, to weigh the animals or weigh a few of the largest animals in order to calculate the dose rate and to dose to the rate of the heaviest animals. It's also important to calibrate the dosing equipment to ensure that the correct amount is being given. Another risk factor for the development of resistance is the number of times that we treat. So it's important to try and reduce the number of treatments that we give. One way to do this is to make sure that we only give a treatment when we know that it is needed by using reliable indicators like performance average daily gain or uh, the level of parasites as determined by the faecal egg count. Faecal egg counts can also be used to determine what products are effective at killing the gut worms. Recent research from Grange has shown that antlementic resistance has now been detected on cattle farms in Ireland. Therefore, it's very important that farmers are aware of this and that they implement sustainable strategies now so that resistance doesn't develop further and that we maintain the efficacy of the products that we have available to us. So some really interesting points there from Dr. Orla Keane. Orla, if I turn to you, in the video you mentioned the development of antelmintic resistance and, and that now it's been detected on cattle farms. Can you tell the listeners, what do we mean by antelmintic resistance? Okay, so I suppose there's been a lot of talk recently and you would have heard this this morning and as Frank mentioned earlier, there's been a lot of talk lately around antimicrobial resistance, where bacteria develop resistance to the products that we use to treat them. But similarly, worms, parasitic worms, can also develop uh, resistance to the products that we use to treat them. So antelmintic resistance refers to worms that can survive a dose or a treatment with an antelmintic with a wormer that normally kills them. So this has been known for quite some time that there's been antelmintic resistance on sheep farms in Ireland, but it was believed to be more rare on cattle farms. However, some of the recent research that we've carried out here at Grange has shown that antelmintic resistance is more common on cattle farms than we previously thought and that the level of resistance to the different classes of antelmintics, um, the, three, the three classes that were mentioned there earlier, the, the white wormers, the yellow wormers and the clear wormers, that um, the level of resistance to these products is different and of course it will be a property of the farm. So again, very much coming back to the point that Frank made earlier about um, how parasite control plans really need to be tailored for the farm in question. Okay, and, and is it an issue for, for gut worms or, or is it lung worms or is it both or, or where do you see a greater issue there? Yeah, so, so all of the work that we've done to date has looked at resistance in gut worm populations. Mm. Um, so as I mentioned, we found quite high, surprisingly high levels of resistance in the gut worms. In terms of lung worm, um, there's been very few studies that look, have looked at resistance to in, um, in lungworm and there's, there's a few reasons for that. It's, a, it's very, very difficult to mm. uh, carry out the test for lungworm and quite often when lungworm uh, causes disease, it's in the pre-patent period. So this is before any of the larvae are shed in the dung. Um, anecdotally, there have been some stories of, of failure of the products for the treatment of lungworm but um, it would appear that any resistance that, that's out there for lungworm is much more rare and that the m most of the cases of resistance that we're seeing are in the gut worms. Okay, and based on, on your research carried out at Chagas Grange, uh, have we been able to identify the risk factors on certain farms? So what, what let's say, uh, encourages, if you like, the development of antimintic resistance on farms? Yeah, so there's a number of factors that we know um, can accelerate the development of antimintic resistance. So I suppose one of the factors um, that we know is the current resistance status. So if we, you know, antimintic, the development of resistance is, is effectively like a, a slippery slope. It goes slowly at the start, but then it accelerates. Mm -hmm. So obviously, if you, if you don't have resistance or have very low levels of resistance, that's the time to implement the strategies to slow it down. Mm -hmm. um, another factor 
factor that we know is important is how many times you treat. So the more you use the product, every time you use the product, you give the resistant worms a selective advantage over the susceptible worms. Mm. So treating um, unnecessarily and when it's not required, that's a huge risk factor for the development of resistance. Mm. A third factor is underdosing. So if you expose the worms to not enough of the drug to kill them, that will also lead to the development of resistance. And then the fourth factor is, is, um, is a factor, it's, it's quite a complex factor, but it's, it's the refugia factor. So what refugia means is it's the proportion of worms in the population that are not exposed to the drug. So these are generally in worms on pasture or worms in animals that aren't treated. So these worms are under no selective pressure to develop resistance. They provide susceptible genes that will breed with the resistant worms and dilute the effect of resistance. And of course, in suckler systems, a great source of refugia can be the mature cows. Okay, so that's interesting. So part of our objective then, as part of a dosing program, is to maintain a population of, of, of worms uh, in the pasture. Yeah, ab absolutely. So I suppose, you know, as resistance develops to these products, as we outlined there, despite the large number of products on the market, there's really only three classes. So it's very important that we preserve the efficacy of the three classes that we have. Um, and so, you know, the solution now is more about, it's much more about planning and including a parasite control plan as part of your herd health plan that will allow you to reduce the amount of wormer that you use. Um, and it is about, you want, you want some worms, you need exposure mm. of the calves to some worms in order for them to develop their immunity. So it's about managing that exposure so that their immunity develops, but they do not suffer uh, production loss or, or clinical disease. Okay, and, and Frank O'Sullivan, uh, as a veterinary practitioner, um, have you seen this rearing its head on farms? Have you seen antilimitic resistance you know, appearing on farms and how is it manifesting itself? Well, certainly we've been familiar with the sheep farmers for a number of years that this has been a big issue. Uh, and it's becoming more and more common now on, on, on cattle farms, both beef and, and, uh, and dairy cross animals uh, being reared. So, well, the best way I can describe this is to give you an example of a case I saw at the weekend where we had a farmer, he had his suckler calves were uh, just starting to cough. Mm. Uh, we we had taken a faecal sample from them um, a week ago and the, the, the worm count was extremely low. So now we're in a bit of a dilemma because is this cough as a result of, if you like, immature lung worms that are migrating through the lungs, causing an, a reaction, causing an issue, but haven't yet matured in the, in the airways, if you like, mm. and therefore no eggs have been laid by adult lung worm. Uh, so the point here is, of course, that the faecal egg test is n doesn't forewarn us about the possibility of lung worm. So that's why the farmer would be key here to be herding his animals and listening for that. If they were previously healthy and now we are in a coughing situation for, and no other obvious reason, we would suspect lung worm and we would feel, you know, warranted in moving in to treat those animals. Um, now, there are some tests we can do. We, we, we can do some tracheal washes for lungworm and fi find those uh, um, evidence of, of the lungworm there, or, or even you know, faecal samples after a while. But for us, in practice, the key one is the differential diagnosis. Is this the tail end of a respiratory viral syndrome, or is it a lungworm mm. issue that's emerging? And there the balances we make, and you know, to come to a conclusion in those, we often with the farmer, ex examine the animals, uh, take our time to think about them, and then uh, use some confirmatory tests and then plan the way ahead. Mm. Mm. I, I suppose, Orla, you know, for many of the farmers watching in this evening, and Frank has alluded to, you know, the, the differential uh, diagnosis and trying to identify, you know, the, the correct treatment. I suppose what farmers want to know is what product to use you know, uh, how much of that product to use, and I suppose it's, it's following the guidance that's provided. Mm -hmm. So, so what, is the, what is the advice around that? So, you know, pr pre previous advice would have been to rotate products that you use, and that is still good advice where you know that all the products are effective. But what's really important is to use a product that works. Mm. So that really involves, coming back to the point Frank made earlier about testing, it's really, really important to test so you know what products work on your farm mm. and then rotate among the products that work. 
But if any of the products are failing or are failing quite significantly, they may need to be dropped out of the rotation because they're no longer doing the job, they're no longer killing the worms and it's leaving the animals still exposed to those worms and it will probably encourage the development of further resistance. So um, in terms of the product to use, you know, we get asked this question a lot, when will I dose and what will I dose with? Mm. And of course, you dose with something that works mm. and the only way you'll know what works is by testing. Okay, so it was previously advised to rotate warmers. Yes. Is, is that still the case or are we saying now to, if it's working to maintain the same dose? Rotate of? within the products that are working, within the classes that are working. As I mentioned, there's three classes. Um, there's a large number of products the mar on the market, but they fall into, into these one of these three classes, the white, the yellow, and the clear wormers. So rotate the classes that still work on your farm. So of course, if that's all of them, then rotate among all of them. Okay, okay. And just in relation again to previous advice, dose and move, is that still the advice or, or, or what are we saying around that? Yeah, so I suppose the advice in terms of, of dosing is not to dose and move to clean pasture because this comes back to this um, point I made earlier about refugia. Mm. So if you treat all of the animals in a herd um, and then you move them to, to clean pasture, so, so you know after grass or something like that where there's very few worms on the pasture, then you very few, you very little refugia. Mm. Most of the worms have been exposed to the drug and any that have survived um, will be resistant and they will shed eggs out onto that pasture. So in terms of dose and move, we would say don't dose and move to clean pasture. I mean, if you're, if you're rotational yeah. grazing and you're not moving to clean pasture, that's, yeah. that's a different story. So rotate within the grazing rotation that you already have established for that group of animals. Yeah, yeah. And, and how long would you think before you move to a clean pasture, how long after dosing do you retain on that, on that grazing yeah, rotation? Yeah, so, so for products that have no persistent activity, uh, you know, up to, a, up to a week should be fine because it will allow them to pick up some more worms, some susceptible worms from the pasture that haven't been exposed to the drug before they go on to the clean pasture. Obviously, if you're using product with a persistent activity, then, then that, will be, that will be different and it will depend on the period of persistence. Okay, you, you, you've touched on products with persistent activity. Uh, can you tell those joining us here this evening a little bit more about those products and are there any specific considerations we need to bear in mind in, in respect of those products? Yeah, so I suppose there's, there's a number of products that have persistent activity and some of them can have quite long persistent activity and they can be quite popular because, you know, um, people feel that now they have their, their worm burdens under control and they don't need to worry about it for a long period of time. Mm. The one thing I would say, I suppose, about these products is that they should be used carefully because, again, it comes back to this refugia story. Mm. If, you are, um, if you treat with a product with a long period of persistency, any incoming worms for that period of persistency, persistency will be continued to be killed by the wormer. So any resistant worms have that whole period of persistency in which they can reproduce and contaminate the pasture with resistant eggs, uh, while the susceptible worms continue, continue to be killed. So if resistance starts to develop, using a product with a long period of persistency will accelerate that development. Okay. Also, as the product tails off in the system, you know, you can have a, a effect similar to underdosing because they're long period of persistency and then they tail off at the end. You can have, um, you know, some therapeutic amounts of the drug towards the end. Okay, so I guess it's it's again about, you know, communication with your veterinary Absolutely. practitioner and, and watching your hair tail planning yes. process. Yeah, so it's about planning this process. Frank, you wanted to come yeah, in. Yeah, just, just to, um, picking up on Orla's point, so what has changed, you know, taking the advice from uh, James O'Shaughnessy and Orla's research uh, in Chagas is that, if we're sampling now, we do certainly a, a sampling during the season, but we also do a key sa uh, fecal sampling maybe 10 days, two weeks after dosing mm -hmm. to see have the worms been removed from the animals. That gives us the confidence that the, uh, the, the, there's still a, an activity there that's, that's re required. Okay, and we've seen, of course, as part of the social media videos that went out today, the whole process for, for fecal egg counts and for sending in those samples. Of course, they're part of BEEP, but they're also part of good practice on farms. So we would encourage, I suppose, faecal egg count and using that as an additional tool in our, in our strategy to control parasite burden on farms. Um, I suppose, Orla, you mentioned earlier, just in respect of the Derry Patrick herd, you know, the, the long dry spell and how that influences, I suppose, the, the, the parasite control plan we have had. Just in terms of samples coming in from, if you like, commercial farms, what have we seen this year and, and, and how has the weather patterns affected the type of, of, of parasite burdens we've seen? 
Yeah, so we did tend to see over the spring uh, parasite burden stayed low as long as the as long as the weather was dry, the parasite burden stay low. Now they do tend to be much lower in suckler systems anyway than let's say in, in calf to beef systems. They do tend to stay uh, stay low. So they do they do stay low. They do tend you do tend to see a jump about probably within the egg count. You'll probably see it three to four weeks after a significant period of rain. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you Orla. Um, really fascinating discussion around parasite burden and, and the parasite control plan on farms. Now we have a huge number of questions coming in, keep them coming in 51444 or hashtag virtual beef week. Uh, and I'm just going to address a few of these to our panel of experts. Uh, I'm going to batch a few together here and a number of farmers, I suppose, Frank and Orla in particular, I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm directing this at, uh, a number of farmers here querying, you know, calves, groups of calves uh, that are shown signs of coughing, uh, you know, calves in some cases that have been dosed maybe a week or 10 days ago, some haven't, you know, what is the, and these are on suckler farms, what, what when, you, when you hear that Frank coming in as a veterinary practitioner on a call, uh, what's the first thing you think of, or I suppose Orla in terms of, you know, the type of samples, what, what sort of analysis would we think of looking at here? I'll go to you first Frank maybe. Yeah, well really you need some laboratory help here to make that differential diagnosis. That's not removing the importance of the clinical exam. For instance, if animals are running at temperatures and they've got you know, a certain noise in the lungs, you'd sus suspect an infectious process going on. You mightn't have that with the lungworm. Mm -hmm. um, in addition then, we may have to uh, take some blood samples and look at serology, or take some uh, tracheal or bronchial washes and look at um, the, 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 if you like the cells there and they'll inform us whether they're eosinophils or whether they're you know bacterial infection or whatever. Unfortunately sometimes we waste the opportunity of post-mortem. Mm. Animals die and it's, it's great to get an early post-mortem and it often can prevent further losses down the road. Mm. So that'll be my uh, key point there. Get a good differential diagnosis, get to the bottom of the problem and it'll give you confidence going on as to what way to treat. Okay, and Orla, in terms of the year we've had, if you, you know, received a query such as that, where would you start and, and what would you suspect, I suppose? Yeah, so I suppose, as, as Frank mentioned, you know, there's a number of different options. Obviously, you know, one of the ones we'd be most concerned about in the parasitology lab is, of course, lungworm. Mm. Um, and, and we do perform Behrman tests for lungworm. I suppose the one thing you have to be aware of with the diagnostic tests in the laboratory that um, you are looking at adult worms in order to see a positive test on a fecal sample that means the presence of adult worms that are um, laying eggs and then the larvae are passing out in the dung the lungworm larvae so it may be a negative test is not definitive that no mm. lungworm is present mm -hmm. it is possibly this pre-patent period before they're laying the eggs it's the larval stage of the parasite and that can still do damage so as Frank said it's part of a much bigger picture okay mm -hmm. okay so again communication and engagement yes. with the veterinary practitioner. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And just to pick up on that then, we have the option now with lungworm perhaps to use a lungworm vaccine. Yeah. Yeah. So that has re-emerged. Traditionally it was one that was used in the past and now it's, it's, it's available again. Uh, there's certain terms and conditions to using it, but if it's a problem in your farm, persistently it's one that you could look at. Yeah. Okay, thank you Frank. Um, a number of questions here for you David in relation to the synchronisation programme and the discussion that, that we had earlier on. Um, a number of people querying about subsequent fertility of cows, you know, the uh, cows that have been subjected to these protocols, is there any effect or any consequential impacts on, on subsequent breeding and fertility? Yes, that's a, an assertion, Paul, that comes up from time to time, maybe at discussion groups and other meetings, you know, and I think we've ample evidence now, both within our own, I suppose, observations and also worldwide, mm -hmm. you know, to show that there's absolutely no, I suppose, effect or latent or follow-on effect of these interventions, which are es essentially all you're doing, we'll say, is briefly interrupting the cow's normal cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, using you know drugs or veterinary medicines, we'll say, that are very, very similar to the cow's own hormones. Yeah. So essentially, you know, there are studies that we can, you know, that we can cite from South America, where you know there's 10 years data with tens of thousands of cows that have been synchronized year and heifers that have been synchronized year on year, mm -hmm. and and you know looking at the conception rates on those herds you know, they're very, very acceptable at 60 to 65 percent. Okay, so no concerns for subsequent fertility no. on that basis. Um, another one here just uh, in relation to synchronization pro uh, programs and protocols. 
cost versus benefit. So obviously these are, you know, there's additional handling costs and, and, and material costs here versus the benefit. Have, have, have you looked at that or, or, or where are the figures on that? Yeah, we've looked at them. I suppose we've looked at, we'll say, traditional AI versus, we'll say, uh, synchronized or timed AI versus natural service. And when you take, I suppose, the, the, the various costs and all, you know, mm -hmm. so obviously we'll say you have the, the, the drug costs, we'll say, and um, involved in, and, and facilities, obviously, as well, we'll say, in terms of the AI usage. And then in terms of the, the, the natural service sire, you have the mm -hmm. purchase cost, we'll say, and again, it's probably the, the most ex singly expensive animal on the herd. Mm -hmm. But not alone that, you know, but the maintenance of that animal subsequently. Mm -hmm. You know, and in most cases, you know, in Irish herds, you know, quite small, and many that are less than 20 cows, you know, the actual cost per calf produced over three to four years for that bull, mm -hmm. you know, is, is, is quite high. Yeah. So when you take the balance, you know, across the board in synchronization or time DI versus natural service, it's very, very similar you know, in terms of the overall cost per calf produced, but the actual value of those calves from the AI are much, much greater. Of and course. again, data from the States and, and elsewhere would support that. Of course, and, and you've seen Artie Barrett, Niall O'Mara and the beef talk earlier today talking about the benefits of AI in producing, you know, a, a better quality calf, if you like, he's more selection in terms of replacements as well as terminal sires and so on. Absolutely. Uh, so, so it's a really important uh, point that uh, there's a number of questions coming in in relation to trace elements, some asking about iodine, some about selenium, uh, some about copper here. I suppose if we batch them all together, and I can address this, I suppose, to, to you, David, and maybe Frank as well. Uh, as part of your study, David, have you, did you look at trace elements, and were there any, re any relationship or implications of trace element if there was a deficiency in reproductive performance? Yes, I, I, I suppose as, as part of that bigger project with um, cow fertility on-farm work that, we, that I cited earlier, the synchronization was one part of it, but equally... Paul, we had another 200 herds across, you know, the 32 counties in, on, in the, on the island of Ireland, because again, it was in collaboration with mm. uh, the Agri um, Science um, uh, uh, Bio, Bio um, Science Institute in Northern Ireland. And we found that, I suppose, there was huge variation in terms of, uh, you know, both within herds and across herds in, in uh, the blood concentrations of the main uh, trace elements. And, and principally, we looked at iodine, selenium and copper. Mm -hmm. You know, about 15% of, of cows and herds were below the, I suppose, recommended levels for copper. But 80% mm -hmm. of cows for both uh, were below the recommended levels for both selenium and iodine. Okay. Now, that was across 6,000 cows, as okay. I say, on 200 herds. However, when we looked at subsequent fertility in those herds, you know, we didn't really see, you know, any indication of poor fertility across mm -hmm. the, that, that huge range. You okay. know, so while in certain herds it may well be an issue, you know, but overall, as a contributor to, I suppose, infertility in herds, it's probably at the lower end of the spectrum. Okay, so it, uh, is it an issue related to thresholds that maybe not right? Or, or do these deficiencies have impact elsewhere in the system? I think there's, you know, obviously the study and most, I suppose, uh, interventions or uh, measurements on farm would be based on blood or systemic levels. Yeah. So again, not always particular copper you know, a really accurate indicator of the copper status. And there is, I suppose, some compensatory mechanisms there within the animal to compensate. Okay. Okay. But certainly it's often cited, you know, as, you know, when there's an infertility issue that it's either potentially pathogen-based or indeed trace elements. Okay. But certainly our work for either would suggest, you know, that while in isolated cases, you know, you know and again, obviously in conjunction with the, the farmer's veterinary surgeon, they need to be followed up upon. But in the greater scheme of things, other issues such as nutrition in particular okay. you know, yeah. would have a much, much greater yeah, impact yeah. on okay. herd fertility. Okay, and, and I turn to you, Frank O'Sullivan, I suppose uh, David mentioned the importance of, of engaging again with the veterinary surgeon mm. and your veterinary practitioner, I suppose. From, mm. In your experience, trace element deficiency, is it an issue or is it only a, a, a real serious issue when you get very low levels? Are, are, are other issues much more important? Yeah, well, we, we tend to take the overall, if you like, helicopter picture. So. In preparing a herd for good fertility, we'd probably look at four key areas. One would be the infectious disease, lepto, BVD. Make sure they're in place. Make sure you have programs in place for those. Secondly, you would have uh, management of AI, good heat detection, you know, good AI technique, fertile bulls. Thirdly, the genetics, and AI comes into that. And fourthly, then, nutrition. Now, there's the macronutrition in terms of the body condition score at the correct times, not too fat, not too thin, mm. but also the micronutrition, such as the copper, 
iodine selenium story. Now, sometimes we can use these, a bit like David said, as a scapegoat or a golden nugget to, to blame everything on or solve everything. So I, I would counsel against that. However, copper in particular in our area is a problem because it's molybdenum toxic. Mm -hmm. Molybdenum is tying up the copper and we end up with a secondary copper deficiency. Now that mainly manifests itself in the young calf actually, mm -hmm. in terms of his growth and, and so on. Uh, again, selenium is not the same all over the country. Uh, there's a vein of land here in Chagas here and you go to the seaside uh, over to Betty's town and it's, it's selenium toxic okay. uh, in the last couple of years. So we have to be careful about supplementing minerals for the sake of it. Iodine then similarly just, you know, it's probably a little bit deficient, needs supplementing, but you know, so again, it's not, there's not one size fits all. It's a little bit bespoke, but it's worth considering as part of the overall four pillars for, for good fertility. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, David. Thank you, Orla. So we're approaching the hour mark, so I want to draw this broadcast to a close. I found it tremendously informative. I hope you at home have found it informative as well. This brings to a close our first day of the Chagosk Fairtrual Beef Week, sponsored by FBD Trust. Today we focused on all things to do with suckler beef systems. I want to thank a few people as I draw this to a close. I want to thank our production team here at Chagas Grange in our studios, Declan McCardle, Marcin Debarra and all their colleagues. I also want to thank our panel members, Professor David Kenny, Frank O'Sullivan and Dr. Orla Keane. I suppose we've had a huge amount of content throughout the day, ranging from all of the content on social media, our beef talk at 12 midday and indeed this evening here at Live at Grange. The organisers for this day should take uh, a lot of credit for this, Aidan Murray and David Kenny. Um, finally, I would invite you to join us again tomorrow. Tomorrow is our second day of the Virtual Beef Week and we're focusing on dairy calf to beef systems. Our social media output will start early tomorrow morning, so please keep an eye on all your social media platforms. Join us again tomorrow at 12 midday for Beef Talk and at 7 p.m for live at Grange. But for tonight, good night from Grange. <laughs>